Imagine, it's over, just over 100 years ago, early March 1915, the people of Nelson in Discovery Bay have come together on a remote stretch of beach to help reinforce a 1,000 tonne sandbag structure, hoping to restore flows to the Glenelg River and see better fishing return to the estuary. It was a fitting end to ni a nine year long campaign of lobbying two state governments for action. A journey that began when the freshwater creek from Piccaninny Ponds was deliberately diverted to the sea by an anonymous saboteur in 1906. While their efforts would ultimately only last for two years, this was a day worth savouring. In fact, it became a legend that would be spoken of for decades to come. Good day, everyone. My name is Mark Backman and I'm an ecologist with a very strong interest in historical geography and expertise in wetland ecohydrology and restoration. I'm passionate about learning from the past and transforming this and present day knowledge into applied and effective action to restore ecosystems today. After spending 12 years working for the state government in South Australia, for the past five years I've managed a small but highly active non-government organisation that now works across South Eastern Australia called Nature Glenelg Trust. If you haven't heard of us, we're a group of applied ecologists that work on a wide range of environmental initiatives uh, with staff based in that zone between Melbourne and Adelaide. Of note for today's discussion, we are also in the process of setting up a small number of habitat restoration reserves, sites we've selected for their strategic value to share with the public what whole of property scale restoration in the agricultural regions of temperate southeastern Australia looks like. Our first private reserve called Eaglehawk Waterhole is a 1700 acre woodland property situated near the western end of the Little Desert National Park and we are currently in the process of creating a further two restoration reserves based around significant previously degraded wetlands in our region. To sum up what drives us as an organisation, we are especially interested in finding innovative ways to fill the gaps that exist between academia, policy makers and the people on the ground. In fact, this theme of linking science and practice is the backbone of Principle 5 from the standards that we are here to explore today. Not long after completing university in the late 1990s, the Nature Conservation Society of South Australia employed me to help them protect coastal swamp scrub wetlands in the southeast of the state. Despite many successes working with farmers to fence off fragments of wetland vegetation on their land, this experience alerted me to the fact that simply restricting grazing was not addressing the key underlying threat to this ecosystem type, and that threat was altered hydrology. Every site I visited for the project, without exception, was impacted by artificial drainage, which was causing a reduction in the extent, depth and duration of inundation. Then as I got to know the wider region over subsequent years, I found this trend was repeated almost everywhere I went, including in reserves. Yet at the time, no one was talking about sustainable wetland hydrology in the region, in fact, it was completely overlooked. This experience had a profound influence on how I now view and interpret the landscape and significantly shaped my thinking about the ingredients of successful restoration in modified landscapes. I later learned that since European settlement, over 90% and 60% respectively of wetlands in South Australia and Victoria, either side of the state border in this region, had been drained, including many sites on public land. So when it comes to identifying and planning a potential wetland restoration project, it goes without saying that water security is the most important ingredient. With this in mind, common factors capable of modifying the water balance of a site in this region include a drying climatic trend, development and land use change, forestry plantation establishment, groundwater extraction for irrigated agriculture, and of course, artificial drainage and upstream diversions. With this context in mind, today we are here, here today looking at near coastal wetland systems where despite these threats, water availability at our case study sites has not yet been irreversibly compromised. There are three major wetland systems situated within Discovery Bay along that stretch of coastline between Port Macdonald in South Australia and Portland in Victoria. Despite local differences in the proportion of different habitat types, broadly speaking they were originally home to similar aquatic habitats, communities and species. Consistent with principle one of the standards, a reasonable level of current and historic reference information is available for comparison both within and between sites. However, the present state of each of these wetland complexes up until 10 years ago is best explained by briefly revisiting the history of each site. Firstly, Eight Mile Creek Swamp was largely untouched until the 1930s and 40s when it was comprehensively drained, cleared and developed for soldier settlement blocks by the South Australian government. Surveys immediately prior to its development confirm 
The swamp was an immense area of peat fen wetland with dozens of rising spring pools dotted across an area of thousands of acres of coastal swamp scrub and aquatic habitats. Development has left the former swamp almost entirely devoid of its original vegetation. But despite these, uh, the degree of change, critical aquatic habitats occur in the spring pools and complex network of drains that remain. One of these features, Ewan's Ponds, is now a tiny reserve surrounded by modified land. Next we have the Piccaninny Ponds cast wetlands, which had its central portion protected as a conservation park in 1969. Having witnessed the loss of Eight Mile Creek Swamp, the Field Naturalist Society of South Australia successfully lobbied the state government to protect a coastal peat wetland before this rare habitat type was entirely lost from the region due to agricultural development. However, despite its conservation status and native vegetation cover, the system was already impacted by a series of artificial drainage cuttings that had altered the character and condition of the site, a process that began with the story I shared actually at the beginning of this talk. Eventually parts of the swamp were fully drained and sown with introduced pastures for grazing at either end of the conservation park, leaving the system in a partially modified state. Finally, Long Swamp, which was partly drained via two ocean outlets cut in the 1930s and 40s, but beyond being used by graziers as rough native pasture, escaped further development until its gradual reservation by the Victorian government as a coastal park from the 1960s onwards. This wetland system is the least overtly modified of the three, entirely consisting of native vegetation that is now adapted to the new water regime. Now that we know what these wetland systems were like, this is a good point to reflect on the biggest challenges and opportunities associated with wetland restoration to help explain to you what happened next. The first key barrier is the cost of access to private land for restoration. Former wetlands that have been drained and developed for agriculture on private land often consist of valuable soil types that most farmers cannot afford to take out of production, especially where former wetlands occupy entire parcels of land. So incentives may need to be paid or land purchased outright before restoration can begin. As many people in this room will know, securing strategically located sites for restoration is not a barrier restricted to wetlands. In the context of the three wetland systems we are considering today, this, is, uh, this item is actually a crucial overarching determinant of where wetland restoration works have occurred. Needless to say, broad scale restoration has not occurred in the Eight Mile Creek Swamp, despite the incredibly important aquatic values associated with remnant springs and watercourses within that system. Put simply, this is intensively developed, high value, heavily subdivided land that is all privately owned, so despite being technically feasible, broad scale restoration is not currently a realistic goal on the basis of land values and current land use alone. In contrast, about a third of the neighbouring Piccaninny Pond system was reserved in 1969, leaving the privately owned parts of the system in the hands of just four landholders, a much more pr uh, feasible prospect for restoration. Fortunately, Long Swamp was already fully reserved for nature conservation. However, this brings us to another potential challenge, which is how you achieve consensus for initiating change on public land. I'm so sure this is something people can relate to. It is interesting that being a protected area doesn't necessarily make restoration a, a straightforward process. Uh, obviously many people, be they the park staff, researchers, community groups or other government agencies, have a strong interest in key management decisions that impact public land. In situations where drains were dug many decades ago and the lack of disturbance allows nature to seamlessly adjust to the new hydrological regime, the history and consequences of change uh, its not often widely understood. As a result, proposing changes to reserve sites that now look natural can hit significant hurdles, particularly within risk-averse government agencies reluctant themselves to initiate change. Indeed, both Long Swamp and Piccaninny Ponds have encountered, and I might say overcome, these types of challenges. Progress was achieved through persistence, patience, good communication, and backed up by sound science and solid historical research, the likes of which you saw in the previous talk. Which brings us to the great opportunity presented by water management as a restoration method, and that is the ability to trigger a self-sustaining, spontaneous process of recovery. This concept is represented within principle two of the standards. The goal of this approach in the context of wetland restoration is to unlock the natural regeneration potential of wetland species already adapted to respond to dynamic hydrological conditions. This is the X factor that sets wetland restoration apart from terrestrial restoration when considering response time, maintenance costs, uh, and the feasibility of tackling more degraded sites. Inundation can provide excellent natural weed control and reduce competition while simultaneously promoting an aquatic vegetation response 
making rapid improvements in ecosystem condition possible. But don't just take my word for it. Let's see what has unfolded at our case study site, starting with Piccaninny Ponds. As part of my former role for the SA Government, my early experiences in the region led me to propose a plan for the coordinated restoration of Piccaninny Ponds wetland system back in 2003-04. Consistent with principle three of the standards, the proposal identified clear steps towards an overall goal of protecting and restoring a wetland system of this type in South Australia. Funding soon followed with an adjustable weir and fishway constructed on the main artificial outlet within the conservation park in 2005 to halt declining water levels in that part of the system. The area upstream of the structure has undergone a dramatic change with the recreation of additional aquatic habitat and other vegetation communities in the vicinity being forced to move basically back upslope. Around the same time, two land purchases by the South Australian Government expanded the existing conservation park, including the 230 hectare farming property now known as Pick Swamp to the west there. To restore the site, most drains across the property were blocked and to protect the drain neighbouring farmland to the, uh, to the west from inundation, a levee bank and regulator were also required along the property boundary. Today, Pick Swamp provides a fantastic example of how a site with a reliable water supply can be transformed from drained cow paddocks uh, back in, you know, being grazed there back in 2007 to a site filling with water soon after as the drains were backfilled to a diverse functioning ecosystem a few short years later. It is almost a decade now since restoration works began and the results really do speak for themselves. The wildlife response has been dramatic with over 170 bird species now recorded by the local volunteer bird watching group during monthly, monthly surveys of the site. Populations of other threatened species such as fish and orchids have either naturally recovered or have been reintroduced to suitable habitats that have been restored. These outcomes illustrate that the site has rapidly reached a self-organising state capable of leading to full recovery consistent with principle four of the standards. Right now over the border in Victoria, locals had long been concerned about vegetation shifts within Long swamp, indicative of a drying trend, reduced flows and loss of open aquatic habitats. However, due to the limitations of previous studies, a lack of data and the current reserve status of the site, there was no consensus for action. Nature Glenelg Trust became formally involved in 2012 when we completed an aquatic fauna survey of Long Swamp and undertook a review of historical information sources which confirmed the trend of change observed by locals. As a result of this work, we proposed a restoration trial, which then formed the subject of a successful grant application to the Victorian Government. We completed the first stage of the trial with the help of 45 community volunteers in May 2014, and that's it there. This was followed by a second uh, low-level minor structure upstream, closer to where the channel exits the swamp. Now, real-time monitoring and, uh, of the actual operation of these structures in 2014 then enabled us to design a more substantial trial structure for the third and final phase, which was installed in April 2015. A few interesting facts about phase three include uh, this structure here required about 6,600 sandbags to complete, including prep and pack up. The job took 11 days spread over a five week period with a maximum of up to 18 people helping on any given day. And in total, it took 122 days worth of human effort to complete. Much of this contributed by volunteers from the local community. However, because of the inaccuracy of digital elevation data in dense vegetation, we were not entirely certain what exact operating level would be required to reinstate flows to the western portion of Long Swamp and ultimately the Glenelg River. This is where we've been able to take advantage of the flexible construction method modifying its operation in real time by simply adding another two layers, uh, 400 sandbags, to achieve a final operating sill level that meets our project goals. This approach is an example of trial and error or adaptive management as described in principle five of the standards. As you can see here, the immediate results on upstream habitats caused by the trial were significant and a year later have been sustained. With the phase three structure in place, a body of deeper water first recorded in 1850 has now reformed. The additional height on the structure added in 2015 has also enabled a westerly surface flow towards the Glenelg River to occur last year for the first time in eight decades, a process being repeated again this year. 
Ecological and photographic monitoring is in place to detect changes and measure the response to the restored water regime, including the detection of shifting vegetation communities and monitoring of key indicator species such as native freshwater fish. So to summarise, as you have seen from the examples presented, <coughs> there are actually many variables in the wetland restoration equation. Land tenure can vary from private sites through to existing public land. Pre-work site condition can vary from completely modified habitat through to intact native vegetation communities. Site data can vary from sites that are well understood in terms of biology, hydrology and elevation information through to those that are not. And finally, methods can therefore vary greatly to accommodate the confidence levels of managers from permanent earthworks and major infrastructure through to temporary measures such as geofabric sandbag weirs, uh, although the last one you saw is unusual in its scale. We don't normally go that big. <laughs> but all of this is academic unless you have, a, have defined what you want to achieve and the hydrological regime you're aiming for because with wetland restoration, and this is the thing people forget, is that you actually have some flexibility to choose. This is a daunting prospect for many land managers and I think a reason why the status quo, particularly on public land, often prevails. I am here today to encourage you, everyone in this room, to be brave in making an active choice to restore our wetlands and other ecosystems, remembering in the case of wetlands that water regime determines everything that follows. The habitats that will form, the species that will live there, and the speed and trajectory of recovery. Most of all, don't be afraid of testing your ideas and initiating change. At Long Swamp, Increasing the depth and duration of inundation is causing a shift towards more desirable ecological attributes in parts of the system. This is favouring key aquatic species and habitats that have been disadvantaged by reduced water availability and drainage over the past 80 years. We are now patiently waiting and watching while documenting that response. At Pick Swamp, with a decade of results to review, it is now clear that the wetland communities in much of the restored area actually differ from what occurred at the site prior to development. This is partly driven by physical changes to the site, like peat subsidence after drainage resulting in more deeper open water. It is also driven by biological factors, like the capacity of different species to respond to restoration after 35 years of degradation. The result is different to what historically occurred at the site, but we've now recreated a wetland type that is severely depleted across southeastern Australia. This new freshwater marsh habitat is teeming with water birds and aquatic life, assisting the recovery of nationally threatened species cycling nutrients and sequestering carbon. It was also included in Australia's newest Ramsar site in 2012, the Piccaninny Ponds Cast Wetlands, only five years after restoration commenced. By any or all of these potential measures and consistent with the standards we are here to launch today, I think this is restoration success. <laughs> I wasn't expecting a round of applause there, but thank you. <laughs> uh, but finally, the projects at both Pick Swamp and Long Swamp have one more key ingredient that is worth a mention, and that's consistent with principle six of the standards, and that is the social and cultural aspects of restoration, or connecting people to wetlands through meaningful shared experience. In fact, this theme takes us right back to where this talk began. Hundreds of people in the community have now participated in the restoration story of Pick Swamp over the last decade. Dozens of locals from all walks of life now have a tangible connection to Long Swamp after helping us fill or shift some of the 7,000 sandbags required for the job. They can share a tale of epic proportions with their kids and grandkids of how they helped emulate the original determination shown by their community 100 years earlier. All those regular people telling stories of wetland restoration to their friends over a cuppa is planting the seed of an idea, an idea capable of inspiring others to act. Thanks very much. Thank <laughs> you.